I, I told a story about us being in a timeshare. Does anybody remember that story that I told? I, I didn't tell you how we got into it. I am very, very anti-timeshare, okay? I, I struggle with one. I literally, like, struggled with it for, like, 15, 20 years. We got trapped in it. Uh, it changed over time. I told you guys some of the stories, all the different things. Uh, but I love, I love the challenge of it, whether it's Orlando or Gallenberg or wherever we were. They would be like, sir, sir, can I offer you two free tickets and dinner out for you and your family for just going through a 90-minute presentation? I'd be like, yes, I'm cheap. Give me the free stuff. And, and, and you'd go through the whole presentation, and I told you guys all about that. But I didn't tell you how we got pulled into it to begin with. We were, we were walking through Gatlinburg, and this guy stopped us, and he said, would you guys be interested in, in the whole presentation thing or whatever? And I'm like, what are you going to offer us? And you have to play the thing. And you're like, ah, oh, no, we're busy, whatever. Oh, wait a minute. We'll also throw in whatever. They're always willing to throw in more. And then, then we, we, we went to the, the presentation, and while we were there, I was like, there's not a chance, there's no way I'm going to say no. I know, I know it's a scam. I know that it's, uh, the, the, the fine print is always there that has hidden uh, fees and all that kind of stuff. So at the end of it, the guy said, sir, I can tell you, you're, you're, there's not a chance you're going to be interested in this. He said, but I would like to throw something out at you that maybe you'd be interested in. He said, this is a brand new resort. We can't even show it to you yet. But if you're interested, we'll let you buy a week of a vacation next year, and we're going to give it to you for next to nothing it's just because we're trying to get exposure to this. So I looked at Jenny, I was like, well, that's cool because it's not a contract. There's no maintenance fees. There's no obligation. We just get a really cheap vacation in a really nice place for, uh, that nobody's ever stayed in. So we did that. So a year goes by. We paid off the week. We didn't get any correspondence back from them, so that was kind of weird. We pull up to the resort, and it's still a construction site. It's not even built yet. There, there's no building. There's no nothing. I mean, there were, there were structures up and things like that. We were like, maybe we got the address wrong, or maybe this, or maybe that. So we ended up going to a, a parking lot. We parked. We called corporate, and eventually we got through to them, and they said, sir, we're so sorry. They were supposed to send out uh, cancellations to let everybody know that they got way behind on production. They said, because of this, they put us up in a cabin, which was actually better than the resort. It was really nice and really big and nice for our family. So the next day, they said, we would like you to come by. We want to give you some stuff to make up for the mistake. I'm like, yeah, that's great. So we go the next day, and I pull in, and I'm telling Jenny even more. Told you it's a ripoff. See how they, they can't even do the one week without messing it up and all these other things. So we walk in there, and I'm so, I'm so cold, man. I'm just, I'm ready, just like, get me through this, give me my free stuff, and I'm done. And the guy said, we're so sorry for what happened. We decided that we're going to give you the best deal on a timeshare we've ever given anybody. And I'm like, I'm not interested. They said, if you come back, if you sign today, we're going to give you rock-bottom prices. We're going to give you rock-bottom maintenance fees. We're going to give you a bonus week to come back and stay next year for free. That doesn't count against your points. We're going to give you bonus points to stay anywhere you want. Where have you ever wanted to stay? And I'm like, Hawaii. They said, we'll give you enough points to stay at Hawaii. And I'm like, all right. And then the guy said, we're going to throw in and throw this in. And then all these other things. By the end of it, I went from, this is terrible to Jenny, saying to Jenny, we would be stupid not to get this. I'm like, what in the world? I said, we just struck it rich. I, I, they, we're we're going we're gonna to have something to be able to put in a will to our kids. If you want to put a debt in your, to your kids. I, I, there's always a catch. It is amazing how I went in my mind knowing something was wrong or something was not great to literally walking out feeling like I did one of the best things ever. Any of you guys ever done that before? There's like some honest people in here in church today. Uh, people, people watching online, they're like, yep, I've done that. Yeah, the, for sure, I've done that. It's crazy how in this story, we're always saying, if I was Adam or Eve, I would have never done it. But it's, notice how the story twists in these next verses that we're going to read, how they went from saying, God has said, if we eat this, we're going to surely die, to the way where we, we get to the point where she turns and says, and she saw that the tree was good. 
How do you go from saying we're going to surely God die because God has said to saying this is actually pretty good? I, I want to rewind from what we did the other week and reread this just to put in context. So uh, Genesis 3 chapter, uh, or Genesis 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, here's the whole spiritual attack, it was just a question. Yea, have God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but the, tree of the, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now remember, Satan is a deceiver. Everything that he did, every, every time we fall into sin, it's not just because we just fell into the trap. We, we almost jump into the trap. He has a way of twisting in our minds. Notice how he started. And if you weren't here the other week, he started with a question. Spiritual warfare is not Ouija boards and pentagrams and seances and all these things. And I'm not saying that that's not demonic. But I'm saying the way that we're normally spiritually attacked is just a thought that we begin to think about in our mind that begins to put us in another direction. He goes from a question about God to saying the words, you will not surely die. He went from catching their attention to thinking that they were missing out on something to believing a lie. Out of all the descriptions, Satan is all these different things, and the, but the, that, that basic thing from the very beginning is he is a deceiver. Now let me show you how he deceived them. He, he gets them to convince them that something was wrong was actually something good. Verse 6, and the woman saw that the tree was what? Good. Let's try that again. And the woman saw that the tree was? Good. She th saw that it was good. Was it good? No. But something changed her mind. Do you understand? It's not just a matter of the sins that we get into. It's like, I don't care. I'll ruin my life. I'll just jump off the edge and just ruin. No, 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 no. You fall into sin because something clicks in your mind where your perspective changes that says, that's not all that bad. Maybe it's not a sin. Maybe I was raised to believe something that is not true. Something changed her mind. And that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. And she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. She goes from one extreme to the next. What happened? Her perspective changed of sin. And I want you to know right now, this is spiritual warfare. Amen. Spiritual warfare is when we say things like this. I know what God has said, but to me, in my mind, this is not that bad. I just don't see it that way. I know what the Bible says, but I just don't see it that way. If you say, I know what the Bible says, but somehow you, you get out of church, you get away from your parents and your perspective change, and you begin to label what God says to be evil, and you say, I just don't view it that way, that is the work of Satan. And this is happening all the time. We get away from church, we get away from godly influences, we get away from the word of God, we get away from devotions, and all of a sudden things that we knew are wrong and knew were sin, we begin to label it's like, I, I just don't feel that way, or I don't see it that way, or from my point of view, or I just don't swallow that anymore, I just don't buy into that anymore. We listen to the world around us, and if you listen to the devil long enough, you will begin to view things differently. Let me just spell it out. In the world around us, abortion, according to the Bible, is murder. Abortion is murder. But after time, and we, we label it, and you watch the news, and they have reports, and they're standing in front of an abortion clinic with somebody standing there. I'm standing in front of a women's health clinic. It's not a women's health clinic. It's an abortion clinic. That's where they kill babies. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, let me say that again. It's, it's killing babies. It's sin. Okay? 
I, I don't care what political party you're with. I preach the word of God and the Bible says it's sin. It is sin. It is sin. It is sin. It goes against God. Killing babies goes against God. It is wrong. We change our perspective to these things. Cussing is no longer corrupt communication, but now we view it as just a way that I express myself. Premarital sex is no longer sin. It's a simple expression of love. Gossip is not really gossip. I'm just really worried about them, and I want you to pray for them. Satan has a way of fully convincing you that what's something that the Bible says is wrong, I don't view it that way. That is spiritual warfare. I don't think it's wrong. I don't view it that it's wrong to stay out of church. I, I don't see what's wrong moving in together. I don't see what's wrong cutting off that relationship when God says to restore one another. The Bible says in Isaiah 50, or 5 verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. You say, why am I being so hard about this? Because you say, well, Adam and Eve were so stupid or so naive and, and deceived for doing this. Let me tell you, we are falling into the same lie today. We're taking something that God says is evil and we switch it on and just say, I don't see it that wrong and I, I, that way. And I'm telling you, even in the culture that we live in today, we have Christians that will take what the Bible says, step away from it and say, I just simply don't feel that that is wrong when God has blatantly said that it is wrong. Satan deceived Eve. He can definitely deceive us. They were innocent. They personally walked with God. It comes out in our lives when we say things like, it just feels right. Have you heard people say, it just, I, I, know, I know, but it just feels right. Even with something, it's like, I know we shouldn't be living together. I know we shouldn't be doing this, but it just, Pastor Tony, I'll just be honest. It just, it just feels right. Say, the, 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 Right there in that passage, Eve literally said that it was pleasant to the eyes. Literally another way of saying it just felt like this was the right thing to do. Eve did it because she felt like it was right. Not because it was right. The Bible says that they were not both deceived. We need to understand that. A lot of times when we tell the stories like this, we talk about Adam and Eve were deceived by the devil. No, Adam and Eve were not deceived by the devil. Let's just lay this out here and be clear about this. Adam was not deceived, according to 1 Timothy 2, uh, 14. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Adam simply gave in to his wife. She was not deceived. Isn't it interesting how... Satan knows how to get to us. It, he, it, was, it was a strategy. It was a matter of, I, I know that I could deceive one, and the Bible doesn't even put the blame on her. It talks about how she was deceived. But the Bible puts the blame on Adam because he gave into his wife. It was, it was a domino effect that Satan knew. Sometimes I can get to them by messing with their heads, and sometimes I can mess with them by giving them somebody in their life with peer pressure that's going to pull them down. Adam simply gave in. Oh, the whole point was, look at how smart Satan is with his strategy, this domino effect. But the Bible says this, and this is how it all comes out, and just label it for what it is. This introduced sin into the world. Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. The Bible talks about it, it just explains it. You want to why, know why the world is so messed up? You want to know why there's so much struggle? Because now we have sin. I'm going to tell you guys right now, I am not a doctor. I am not a doctor, but I'm going to diagnose something right now. There is a sickness in this world that Christians and non-Christians deal with all the time. And when you have a sickness in your life, sometimes you can't diagnose what the problem is, but you feel the side effect of it. Do you understand that when sin came into the world, there was a side effect that came in, that people are sick with sin. There, there's a heaviness, there's, there's a shame, there's a guiltiness that comes into our life. The feeling that something is not right, that we cross the line and it has an effect on our lives. Because we were not meant and created by God to live with sin. It is like a disease. It takes root, it messes with your mind, it messes with your heart. It mess, it, 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 we were not meant to live in sin because God is the opposite of sin. We were meant to have God in our lives. 
So if I don't have God in my life, if I'm not walking with God, I'm not going to feel happy. I'm not going to have joy. I'm not going to have peace. We know that something is wrong. A lot of times people are like, I don't know what's wrong. Even celebrities, have you ever noticed this? How they're on their third and fourth and fifth marriage and they're still not happy? Yeah. They, they, can, they can have the, the elaborate vacations, the private yachts. They talk on, you, know, you watch all the, 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 the YouTubers and everything that will highlight their houses and their cars and all this. Then they're still not happy because God is the source of happiness. We're always trying to strive to fill that void that something is wrong or something is missing in my life. If things are not right between me and God, everything feels wrong. And nothing fills the gap. And the Bible says, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin when it is finished. Have you ever thought about, and I say this all the time because it just, that just sticks out in my mind. It says, when lust hath conceived, the idea of looking at things differently, it brings forth sin. And sin, that which goes against God, when it is finished. Have you ever thought about why it's worded that way? Sin takes a toll on your life. Sin runs a course in your life. Sin has an agenda in your life. Sin, when it is finished, it is, it is like a sickness that comes into our life. It doesn't just come, it stays, and it corrupts, and it changes. And the Bible says, And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Like going to the doctor, you say, that, like, doctor, I think that something is wrong. I just feel off. I, I, I don't know what's causing me to feel this way. You begin to describe the symptoms, and God points out the reason for it. Because here's the thing. Sin has an impact on our lives. Sin brings shame. Yeah. It's amazing how Adam and Eve didn't know what was wrong. God was not standing there. Have you ever noticed that? God was not standing there when they ate of the tree and says, you shouldn't have done that. The Bible doesn't even say that God was even around. And I know we know that God is omnipresent. God sees all and God knows all. But Adam and Eve were by themselves. And all of a sudden they had a self-awareness that something was wrong. Sin brings shame. They knew something was wrong. It's a natural effect. The Bible says in verse 7, the eyes of them were, uh, were, were both open. They saw their mistake. They, they, they saw, they felt the heaviness of this. They, there was an awareness. Let me tell you, there was an awareness of sin, but they didn't know how to deal with it. It, it is described here that they were both naked. An awareness that something was off, a feeling that I messed up, that something is not right, something feels off. And I'm telling you, when we live in sin, a lot of times people are walking around unhappy, whether it's harbor bitterness you have an addiction in your life. Maybe you're, at, at a, you're, you're holding anger against somebody or you're dealing with like whatever it is. You've, you've got that in your life and you know something is wrong, but you can't put your finger on why do I feel this way? Now, I've showed you guys in the past uh, about my dog, Peter Barker. I, I, that's, our, that's our superhero dog. This is how he looks most of the time. Okay, he is... He, this is our guard dog, okay? So if, if, you, if you enter into my house without an invitation, I'm going to warn you now, you will be licked to death, okay? That's, a, that, that's just how, how our dog is. It's like, Jenny was always saying, well, it'd be nice to have a dog in our house to make us feel safe. We don't feel safe with our dog. He, I, I don't care who knocks on the door, he runs up to them to lick them and, and jump on them or whatever. Uh, so we came home the other day, and I'm telling you, every time Jenny comes home, Jenny comes through the garage, she parks in the garage, he knows the garage door opener, and he comes right to the door, and he jumps around the door until she comes in, because that is Jenny's dog. Okay, I'm telling you right now, that dog loves Jenny to death. It's like, it's, he's obsessed with Jenny. And I think Jenny spoils him a little bit, but that's another story. You do, a little bit. So we come home, and he's not at the door. And I am like, that is so weird that our dog is not running to the door. I'm like, what in the world? So we walk inside, and there's these granola bar wrappers all over the floor that all are open. And I, we, we look at them, and I'm telling you, I, I didn't tell our dog, hey, look sad or whatever. I had to go looking for our dog. 
I found him in the house, and this is the look. Now, now go back to the other picture, if you can go back to the other picture for just a second. Okay, is there a difference? <laughs> just you guys tell me. I didn't say, feel bad, you know, like, you did something horrible wrong. Now go back to the other one, and this is what you get. You say, that's a dog. I know it's a dog. But something internally made that dog feel like I did something wrong. And I'm not saying that dogs have a spirit. I'm not saying any of those things. I am simply saying that there is something that comes an awareness. There is an awareness that something's different. If you're living in sin, you fall into sin, you tell somebody off, you cut somebody off, you say something on Facebook and you walk away, you just like, ah, and then we begin to justify it. It's not a big deal. Everybody does it. It's not my fault. I, what's, I, I don't understand. Shame is not all bad because it brings an awareness to our lives. It brings an awareness that something's wrong. The same way if you get around somebody and they say, hey, you got a little something on your face. And you're like, oh, okay. And then you, you, you just brush, brush your face off and you're thinking, did I get it? So the next time you walk up to somebody, you're standing there the whole time doing this. And you guys know what I'm talking about? You're like, whatever. And then they're just staring and it's already off your face, but you still, in your mind, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? I'm not crazy. In the back of your mind, it's like they're looking at something on my face. You know, I got a, a bat in the cave or something. It's like, what's going on here? It's like, I, I feel like, that's a booger, by the way. So it's just, <laughs> it's like something is, something is off here. It's like somebody keeps looking at my face. Something is not right. And there's an awareness. There's a self-consciousness that comes about you. Adam and Eve were shameful. The God, points, God points this out in verse 25 of chapter 2. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. They, they didn't feel the need to hide or cover because there was nothing wrong. There was no sin. They were innocent. They felt exposed. Sin has a powerful effect on us because it pulls us from God. And there's people that are living miserable in their life and they don't know why because they're not dealing with the sin in their life. This is interesting. Let me show you verse 7. And the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. It's human nature. Now th the thing about it, nobody said to them, it's like, you should cover up. No, God wasn't there. They, they didn't read in the Bible or anything that said that you should cover up. It was human nature for them to feel exposed or feel embarrassed or feel shameful the same way that Peter did for doing wrong. There's, it's human nature to feel that way, but it is also human nature for us to try to fix the shame. There's a reason when the Bible talks about surely he had borne our sins and carried our shame when the Bible talks about what Jesus did, there's a reason that we go all the way to Adam and Eve in the garden, that they were naked and they tried to cover themselves up. But when Jesus took our place, they stripped him on the cross. We, we, try, to, we try to beautify the cross a little bit. It was, it was gross, embarrassing, and shameful. Every bit of the cross was. They stripped him down and hung him on the cross, exposed, because they wanted him to feel the shame. Jesus was taking our place to deal with our shame. When somebody walks out of a courthouse, they've been convicted of a crime. Have you ever noticed what they do? They cover their face. They drop their heads. They pull over the hoodie. Why? Because it's shameful. We try to cover our sin. Adam and Eve with the fig leaves was their desperate attempt to fix their problem. When we feel this, and we all do, when we feel this, we try to fix it. That is why if you ask somebody, if you died today, would you go to heaven or not? And they say, I, I, I think I'd go to heaven. I, I, I try to be a good person. Why is it a natural response in our mind when they say, I know I'm a sinner, but I try to do good to deal with the bad? It's human nature to do that. And all of us struggle with this. They try to fix it. They were, the, the fig leaves were nothing more than a desperate attempt to change how they felt, to cover the shame. Now I'm going to ask you guys a question. If the fig leaves were enough, why did Adam and Eve still run and hide? Because you can't cover your shame. Amen. There's nothing you can do to offset what we've done. They couldn't fix it. 
Living with that weight of shame is an awful way for us to live, but so many people do it. They don't do it. You say, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Only the blood of Jesus can make us feel covered. And by the way, we'll get to this next time we get into this passage. God kills the animal and covers him with the skins. Why? Proving from the very beginning, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of your sins. But watch what happens next. Sin brings shame, but sin brings fear. These are the side effects. Nobody told them to do this. This was an internal response to something that was wrong. So the question is, what do you do when you fail? We would say, well, we run to Jesus, do we? Because there's a voice in our head that tells us to run in the opposite direction. Notice what they do. This is just, nobody told them to do. This was just human nature. And they heard the voice of the Lord of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. My question is, what made them run? Who made them run? Sin will make you want to run from conviction. Sin will make you want to run from church. Sin will want to make you run from the people that are going to call you out. Because I don't want to address my sin. The act of covering themselves, excuse me, did not take away the shame that they felt. I'm going to tell you, the fig leaves were not enough. All the things that we try to do were not enough. So they, in their mind, try to run away from what we try to do is outdo our, our, with good works. <clears throat> we try not to mess up anymore. We try to cover up what we've done. We try to uh, justify what we do. I'm going to tell you right now, spiritual warfare will tell you to run from God rather than running to God. And the same thing happens today. Have you ever noticed how when you mess up, and, and I'm, I'm talking to people who are online, I'm talking to people that are listening on the podcast right now, I'm talking to people that are sitting in this room. Isn't it crazy how the one thing that we know as Christians that will help us deal with the sin and the shame in our life is just confessing it before God. But what we do, we begin to pray and we think, why would God want to listen to me when I've messed up so bad? Has anybody ever felt that way? We, we almost like stop praying. We get, dear God, is like, why am I doing this? I, I, I've messed up so many times. I, I'm a hypocrite. I'm coming to God as a hypocrite. Sin will make you run in fear why we don't want to go to church i don't want people asking where i've been how are you doing can i pray with you about anything like that it's spiritual warfare the lie of the devil remember he works for through lies run when you mess up the truth is sin will make you want to run but the love of god will always seek you out Amen. now i love this we're going back to the beginning the very first sin the fall of man God did not go looking for Adam and Eve because he didn't know where they were at. And I know that we all know this. When God went walking through the garden, Adam, where art thou? And they're hiding in the bushes over there, wherever they were at. It's not like God was like, where are you at? You know, God wasn't trying to figure it out. God was letting Adam and Eve know, I know what you did, but I'm still looking for you anyways. The Lord God called unto Adam and said, where art thou? I want you to know we might run from God, but God does not run from us. And he said, I heard the voice of the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself because I messed up. Remember, spiritual warfare is mental warfare. Something internally told him to run, but it wasn't God. If it's not God telling you to run, then who's telling you to run? And I'm telling you from any situation. It's like we're not running from a tree in the garden because we, we cross the line, but we cross lines all the time, but we still run from God. The Bible says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. You think about that, in that mind that I don't belong in church, I shouldn't be in life group, I shouldn't be around Christians, I shouldn't show up, shouldn't check in with my friends, I shouldn't do that. What's making you think that? It's amazing how we're literally describing spiritual warfare, but if you watch some sort of movie and it's like demonic this, and you know, you, you guys know what I'm talking about, all the sorcery and casting out demons and holding up the crosses. Satan is much more sleek than that. He's much more subtle than that. All he's got to do is on Sunday morning, whispering your, your head, you've messed up, 
you'd be better off staying home because you don't want to, you don't want to go there and be another hypocrite. That's how he fights us. The truth is, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. We run and hide, and God comes looking for us. You know why? Because he doesn't give up on us. His love never fails. It never gives up. It never walks out on us. Sin will bring shame to your life. It will be a sickness, an awareness, a feeling of failure, and something is wrong. Sin will bring fear to your life. You will run. You will hide. You will cover you will lie, you will do whatever it takes. But notice what happens next. And I'm going to tell you, this is, this is what I was most convicted about studying this. Because it's a part of this that we often don't explain or even dig into. Sin brings blame. And I'm going to tell you, spiritual warfare is described in so many different ways. But I'm telling you, what Satan wants more than anything is for you to stay in your shame, to not find freedom or healing from your mistakes. The question is, why not just get it right? And he said, who told thou, who has told thou that, that, what, that thou was naked? Has thou eaten of the tree? Now it's a question. Did you eat of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? That was a simple question. Now I'm going to tell you guys straight up, this is the answer. When God went to Adam, did you eat of the tree? The answer should have simply been yes. Why is it that we struggle admitting our faults? Now, you guys know the story. This is what happens. You want to see spiritual warfare? You want to see Satan at the beginning of this? God already knew the answer. They knew that they did wrong. You know what funny this is? Adam and Eve never knew how to sew. They've never sewed anything together. Can you imagine how pathetic those clothes looked on that day? You guys know what I'm talking about? They took fig leaves, and we described as, like, put them together. They probably, I mean, looked like they just were wearing rags or, you know, like, it, it was probably the most pathetic thing. And they're standing there in front of God, like, we try to cover this up. God knew that was admitting to them, admitting to God that they sinned. And the man said, the woman that thou gavest me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. First response. Eve blames God and Eve blames, or Adam blames God and Adam blames his wife. Do you know how the first thing that we do whenever, whenever we're caught with that, there's something inside of us that says to us that this is not my fault. I promise you the biggest thing that we all deal with in life and sin is this is not my fault. You want me to prove it to you? Just get pulled over by the police. Just, just get pulled over for speeding, and you're, if you're going 5 or 25 over, I promise you, you're sitting there mumbling on the side of the road. There is people out there selling drugs to kids, and I'm being pulled over by the cops. Wish they would just do their job. It's not my fault. This was a trap, and it should be, the speed limit should be higher than this. Rather than the cop coming up and just saying to them, were you speeding? Yes, sir, I was, and just be done with it. But there's something in us that tells us that I can't take the fault. It's somebody else's fault. Eve does the same thing. Now, this is, this is us to a T. And the Lord God said unto the woman, what hast thou done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Can I interpret this for you? The devil made me do it. Literally is what she says. The devil made me do it. This is not my fault. I was, I was deceived. It's the world that we live in. And I'm telling you right now, every single one of us deal with this constantly in our lives. Rather than admitting our sin, we blame everything and everyone. There's people that are not in church right now because you still blame your parents for dragging you to church as a kid. There's people that are not in church because they blame the pastor that they had when they were a kid or there's hypocrites in the church or I, 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 I cuss this way and I have these problems this way because, because I grew up around this all the time or I was exposed to this or my kids pushed my buttons or whatever it is, you're constantly justifying it. Amen. We will never break free of the sickness of sin where we're constantly blaming everybody else for our sin. Let, let, let me explain this to you. Man, God, God showed me this. I've been a Christian most of my life. I've been in church all of my life, and I never thought of this. At the very beginning, who trace it all the way back to the beginning, here's Satan's first attack. And you know what Adam and Eve do to deal with it? They struggle with pride. Listen to this. Satan was kicked out of heaven because of pride. Pride is, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. 
I'm justified in my actions. Pride is in every single one of us. The very root of the sin that they had from the spiritual attack was pride. I don't take the blame. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. When God comes in to deal with our sin, and I'm telling you whether it's salvation or anything else, the Bible is very clear on this. We talk about salvation being believing in our hearts. And let me tell you, the, the truth is salvation is believing in our heart, but there's more to it than this. And have you ever wondered why? Because God's combating the, the pride in our lives of it's not my fault. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, listen to this. Have you ever thought of this? This is, this is the scripture, Romans 10, 9. If we what? If thou shalt what? Let's try that again. If thou shalt what? Confess. It starts with this. Are you a sinner? Do you need salvation? Yes. Simply this, God, I am messed up. It's combating the pride. Because all of the excuses that we have in our hearts and minds that keep us out of heaven is, is it's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault, I didn't do it, it's my parents' fault, it's the church's fault, it's the devil's fault. No, it is our fault. We all sin, we all fall short. Just confessing. You are God, I am a sinner. I messed up, you did not. I ask God for you to forgive me of my sins that come into my life. I believe that you will forgive me, that is salvation. 1 John 1, 9, if you ever thought about this, this is talking about healing in our heart when it comes to the sinful condition that we have, the heaviness of guilt, the heaviness of shame, the heaviness of fear, and all these other things. If we confess our sins, confess. You bow at the altar, you bow in your bedroom, you bow in your car, you bow in the pew at the church, and you say, I did wrong. It's my fault. I'm sorry, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The antidote to the heaviness of shame in our lives is combating the pride that's in all of us. It is our fault. I know that there's people here that are just worn out. Something is wrong and I don't know what doesn't have to be a murder. It doesn't have to be some horrendous sin that we label. It can be harboring bitterness against another person that's in church, another person in my family. It can be an addiction that I'm hiding and I'm justifying. I am excused for doing this. It could be a lifestyle. It could be how we date. It could be how we talk. It could be how uh, the entertainment that we have. But something is wrong inside of us and God just wants us to come out from, from hiding and just simply say, God, I did it. I'm sorry, but as long as you're blaming others and you keep hiding from God, God sees your heart and he knows that we're miserable and it will never work this way. It won't work this way. Say, man, I wish you'd preach that to the world. No, I'm preaching it to the church right now. I'm preaching it to all those watching on Facebook Live and listening to the podcast, preaching to you. We are miserable in our sin because we were not meant to live with sin in our lives. So what are we going to do about it? We're broken. Sin messes us up. But I'm telling you right now, when he says, if we confess our sins, the word if literally means there is a choice. You can walk out of here and keep living the same way, or you can choose to say, I lay it at the feet of Jesus, and I ask God to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I say this to those that are lost, that are watching online, or those that are sitting in this room right now, That if you do not have God in your life, you've never dealt with the sin in your life, you are miserable. There is no peace apart from God. There is no fulfillment apart from God. There is no healing apart from God. And you are covering, you are running, you are justifying, and you are messing up because nothing will fix it. Salvation is simply the verse that we just read, going to God saying, I am a sinner and I admit it, and I ask you, God, to forgive me of my sins and to come into my life and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That is salvation. So stop trying to do good works when he's already died on the cross to do what you could not do for yourself. And I speak to the Christians, because there is Christians here that are unhappy in their lives. 
you go to church, you go through the motions of it, you listen to Christian radio, you love worship songs, all those things are right. But something internal and you're carrying shame and guilt that you should not carry because you're not confessing the sin and dealing with the sin and just saying, God, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm tired, I'm sorry. 